welcome to our February 2023 members program. Um, I'm Wayne Matthews. I'm the president of the Guild. If you don't know me, <clears throat> um, we do this every month. And like, as you heard, we've had people from New Zealand, from the East Coast, now from Mexico. It's like Zoom has made this possible. When we only met in person, if the person lived more than an hour away, the chances were it wasn't happening. So um, it's been remarkable for me to see. So there are a few announcements tonight. Oh, first of all, are there any, are there any visitors here? Other than Miguel? <laughs> How about no? first timers? Tracy. Who are you, Tracy? Where am I? Who are you? Who are I? Yeah. I am a new person in town and a new person in clay, and I am a new member of the guild. And I am living right now in Ventura on the east side, and I'm really glad to be with you. And I'm looking forward Thanks. to Miguel this evening. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, thank you. Tracy and I met at the at the show in Ventura in November. Um, okay, so a couple of announcements. I've got a couple, and then um, I did not make a list, so I'm just anyone who's on the board or committees who's got an announcement, wave and um, say what you need to say. So first is, I wanna say to this group here, if, if you didn't see the notice from last month, the middle of last month. So we've changed how announcements are happening and we're sending out two announcement messages, which is, are now called, what's new? And what's all the only thing that's going to be in there is what's new. So the first that the one that's coming up here on the first will include the notice and the link or the directions to go and find the video from this meeting. The one on the 15th will include the newsletter, like how to find the newsletter and the president's meanderings, um, et cetera. So changes to pages, new things that are on the website. So that's all we're going to, we're just going to be feeding you the new stuff. The other thing is um, we've started this month a treasure hunt related to the website. So there's a $25 gift card up for grabs from a raffle. And this month, what it requires is if you're a regular member, you need to create your members directory info, which is a short bio and a photo and create a photo album. If you're a plus member, you need to do those two things and take your photo album and turn it into a member's portfolio, um, or portfolio, which is just a matter of going in there and linking it to the photo album that you created. And people who have done that on the 10th, by the 10th of March, we're gonna go make the list of who everyone is who's done that and do a drawing and this month, whoever gets pulled out of the hat will get a $25 gift card. A couple of months, we'll do more complicated things. It'll be a $50 prize, but in general, it'll be 25 bucks a month for some little things we're going to make up. And there That's are tutorials I... for how to do this, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So if you hadn't noticed or didn't notice in the What's New website, if you go to the Members menu, at the top is tutorials. And we've started building video tutorials that are all in little bite-sized pieces. So we give you the total time for the whole tutorial, which may be 30 minutes, but each little one of two minutes, a minute and a half, three and a quarter, like whatever, we tell you how much time it's gonna take for each one. And we've broken it down into the um, kind of separate tasks that have to be done to fulfill on whatever the larger task is. Um, that's it for me. Anyone else? Um, just a reminder of you making your pieces for the Beatrice Wood Show. And the well, photos are due? Those are 
due June 11th and all the entries will be online, but we can talk about that next month. No yeah. rush for that. Okay. Anything else? Okay, Foz. All right, well, we've got an exciting program tonight. It's a collaborative. Um, Rebecca and Jeannie uh, have been working locally and Rebecca's been able to bring in a special guest presenter from Mexico who will be doing the main presentation tonight. So what I'm gonna do right now is turn it over to Rebecca. And when Jose's presentation's completed and we finish our question and answers, then we're gonna be turning the program over to Jeannie and she's gonna be talking about the prep work for the next clay challenge, our, our pit fire potluck and gathering that's gonna happen and how we're gonna prepare for that. So don't leave. <laughs> Okay, Rebecca, all yours. Okay, thanks. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rebecca Russell, and my husband and I have been a trader for the village of Mato Ortiz in Chihuahua, Mexico for oh, 25, 30 years. I don't even know. It's been a long time. And a trader, what you do is you go down to the village. We go down to the village, and we get pots, we go around and visit all the potters and buy pots and bring them back to the United States. And at first, all we did was go from one art craft show to another craft fair to another craft fair. But we finally found a great gallery in Santa Barbara. It's called the 10 West Gallery on Annapone Street. And they carry the Mato Ortiz along with their abstract paintings on the wall. So it looks like what it looks like in your house. Um, Jose is a fourth generation, right? Uh, potter from the village, and he learned from his family. He didn't go to class and take learn how to do it. And he's he's known his style is highly polished, uh, burnished, thin walled scraffito pieces, and they're gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. Just a little history, if you've never been introduced to Mato Ortiz. Mato Ortiz is a very small village at the end of the road. And I think there may be 1,500 plus people that live there now with two or 300 potters. And most of the people in the village are connected somehow to the pottery making. Uh, Mato Ortiz goes back to 1200 AD. There is a, was a group of Indians that lived in Casas Grandes about 12 miles out, and they made pottery for utilitarian purposes. For some reason, the Indian group got disbanded, they left, and then pottery making was not made for a very long time. And then a group of people in the village started finding pots and shards and they realized that this was done before and that everything was there and they could do it. Some of them have become very famous, like you were saying, Maureen, as uh, Juan Casada and Spencer Cotton McCollum did a lot of work in getting it to the States. Um, nah, I, don't, I had wrote down what I was gonna say. Uh, but anyway, today, these are museum quality pottery pieces. And they are in major museums and galleries and in collectors' um, items all over the world. The United States, all over the United States, uh, Europe, Japan, and some of them are down in South, Af South America, like in Brazil. Um, and that's the only ones I know about. Um, so tonight, that's all I have to say. And there's many books and many visit, uh, videos on Mato Ortiz if you need to have more information or would like to have more information. Tonight, we have invited Jose Almarez. He is a fourth generation potter from the village. And he will do a demonstration on how the people in Mato Ortiz prepare their pots for firing. Much different than we do. <laughs> okay. That's all I have to say. So the only thing I'm going to suggest is people may want to change the view on their device so that you're seeing the speaker instead of the gallery view of everybody's faces. And that way you'll have a better view of Jose and his work. Does everybody know how to do that? Up in view? 
Yeah, so up in view, you can okay. click on it and it. select speaker. Okay. All right, Jose, it's all yours. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. And uh, like Rebecca said, my, my full name is Jose Miguel Almeraz Hernandez. It's a mouthful, I know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, um, my auntie was the one that showed my mother how to make pottery. So that's why I consider myself like fourth generation. It really wasn't like generational wise because it's my mother's sister. Then her sister showed her. So I consider myself a fourth generation, but it's technically not true. But, uh, but I'm gonna show you guys my, my workspace. Let me switch this around. And uh, this is where I work from right here. This is my uh, table in my kitchen. As you can see, this is my kitchen, this is my home. And this is very typical for most people in Matortis because most people work from their homes. Some of the more established people have actually just workspaces for this, but this is usually what people do. And uh, I'm, gonna I'm gonna start by making, um, I'm not gonna actually lift the whole piece because it takes me around two hours to lift a piece, but I'm just gonna show you the base and then give you a general idea of the pinch and coil technique. So this is a plaster mold. Here's a little piece of clay. I'm trying to get it closer. And these are the tools that they use for, uh, we use for lifting the pieces. This is just a hacksaw blade cut. This is a syringe to cut the clay as you're lifting it as need be. And this is just a plastic lid to scrape and get the thinner walls as you can. And of course, this is a roller pin for tortillas. So we call this the tortilla. Just flatten it out. I should say that I already kind of played with this clay to get the air out you try to get all the air pockets as you can out. Try to use a lot of the, the palm of your hand and not so much the fingertips. And this clay was sourced locally too. We have no, uh, there's people that sell clay, but they source it locally as well. All this, this is called, we call this covenanto clay, which is just really like the side of the clay. It's by an old church. And everyone knows this as the Corinto clay. It's kind of a reddish brown clay. If you have questions, is it best to ask them as you go or wait until the end? However you guys like. I could talk and work at the same time. So you said this was reddish clay from the by the side of the church. Has somebody um, purified it or, I mean, processed it? Yeah, in so, so this takes around two weeks to process the clay. You got to okay. go collect it. You soak it. Then you gotta screen it off, get all the impurities out. Okay. And they just stuck to the table horribly. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot my we wife all know that feeling. earlier. <laughs> and uh, she made bases and it's white clay. So the clays don't really like to mix. But yeah, it takes about two weeks to get the clay processed. So you put that in there. Now I don't have enough clay, but this you just put the base to get the lips out. This should be lifted further up. And this is where this little tool comes in. You want to scrape it along this to really let it sit in the, in the mold. And then I would take, I'm just gonna take a piece of this because I don't have more clay. This is the coil. Let 
I'm trying to condense everything quick. Just take your time. Okay. So this is when they would go pinch and coil. That's what the pinch and coil technique is. If I have more clay, I'll show you. But honestly, it takes a long time comparably to like the throwing wheel. The throwing wheel is just like so fast because I've, uh, there's an American guy that brought down the throwing wheel and he, he would lift like so many pieces in a little bit. So that, after you lift the form and obviously there's different forms, but this is a, a lot of people do this form or like we call this a, just a, a huevo, a ball. Or some people make very unique forms like Diego Valles and a couple of others in the, in the town make very extravagant, even like all kinds of forms, honestly. But this is the more traditional form is this round one. So after you lift it, you get that form. It, you let it sit for about two days, three, depending on the weather, to let it get leather hard. So you can actually take it out. You have to take it out of the mold. And that's where uh, you get the hacksaw and you thin out the walls after it's leather hard. And then once it's leather hard, this is already a piece that's lifted a white piece. Once it's leather hard, you have to sand it. I do about three different grades of sandpaper and finish it off with the sponge. So this is already sanded. It's smooth. Then once it's at that step, you have to paint it, which is, uh, this is our paint. It's a manganese slip. So we also go to the, an old mine to get this paint. And it's a hard, real hard material. You have to grind it down and let it sit in water for about a, two days to let it separate. And then you get, we get a special clay that fires clear that actually makes the manganese stick to the piece. Because without that clay, it won't stick. So I'll show you guys a little bit. And some of the people that do the more, I would say like traditional drawing, they do it with these hair brushes that are made uh, out of human hair. My, this is my wife's brush. She made this and it has about 15 hairs. The fewer the hairs, the finer the lines. Give you guys an example. Real thin. So they, they paint real intricate lines like that. And I can't paint like that. So what I do, this is a piece of velvet, just a little piece of velvet. Take it, and I just put big swaths of on it. So Jose, is that slip that you're using, um, you said you, it's, it's, um, it's manganese and, and a clay? Yeah, there's a certain type of clay that we get that fires clear. Mm -hmm. it does, it's kind of reddish, but once it fires, it has no color. So that's what makes the manganese stick to the piece itself. Okay. Because back in the days, people didn't know how to make the paint, and they'd have to paint the pieces when it was leather hard. So you'd have to lift the piece all in one day, then paint it right away as well. And uh, Macario and the Ortiz has really innovated this new paint with mixing it with that clear firing clay. And so are you just using the, the fines and letting the water settle out? Yeah, you, okay. you let the water settle out for about two days. So first we break it up because it's real hard. It's a real hard mm -hmm. mineral. You break it up with the sledgehammer. Then we get a, a old railroad, piece of railroad like the metal and you break it in between those. And then you let that sit for about two days. Let the water settle off and then you mix it. There's a ratio of mixing it with the clay though as well. Okay. You don't want too much clay because then it'll like overpower it and it'll kind of flake when you put it on there. Because if you can see this, it's really fine. You don't see no borders. And uh, how it's green, like I've, some of the more other potters, sometimes they'll do like what I've heard Americans call bis firing. Mm -hmm. where they slightly fire it so it's like less likely to break but i just do it slow in pauses 
if I were to paint all this just black, the most local is most likely would break. It's going to absorb too much paint, too much water. And also, I can't do this when it's uh, windy. If it's too windy outside, like some little gust of wind creeps in here and it'll break it. Mm. But once I have it all nice, I do about three or four passes. I'll do this, let it dry, do it again, let it dry until I can't see any white of the clay beneath. And uh, this is a piece that's already, already pasted with the black paste. Then I take this bar, this is just hand soap, jabon sote, and I grind it down with a butter knife. Get a real fine like powder. And this acts like a lubricant for the river rock. So I smudge this, smudge it on the piece. And uh, I have this, this is an old, old rock. This is was like, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it was Pilo Mora's rock. Cause my wife learned from Lucy Mora. So this mm. is a real old rock, it even has tape on it. And I've had other rocks, but I don't know, this is just the one I like. <laughs> <laughs> and everything that's been smudged, I just put pressure on it. And that's the stone burnish. You can really see the big difference in the shine. How many times do, do you burnish it? I'll do at least two burnishes to begin with. Then I'll do a third one before I fire it. So I'll have no like opaque parts. So I want the whole piece shiny where I want it shiny. So do you use soap each in between each, each time? Yeah, like if you really want to because if you don't, I can even kind of show you guys just for the sake of the group. This is no soap. You see how it's just lifting it up? It'll lift up the paint. And if you're going too fast and it's not lubricated enough, you'll just take a big swath of paint off. Then you have to go. And then the bad thing is once the soap's on it, you can't paint it again. Because yeah. the paint, the soap doesn't let the, the paint stick. It's like too oily, I guess, or I don't know what it is. So once I have it all, once I have it all polished how I like, I'll come in with a pen and I'll draw whatever design I have in mind. Like I'll have, I have my designs I usually do. So I'll just do one quick. And these are my scraffito tools. This is my real thin line. We can't which see is, that uh, very well. Turn it, turn it to us. We can't see your design. No, your design on your pot. Oh, you really can't see it too well because it's like the pin. The pin really doesn't show up. It just kind of leaves an off shiny part. Okay. And and it, this won't show up once fired because the pin, the ink will fire. The fire will fire it off. But but these are just. These are tools for sharpening a chainsaw, a rat's tail, I think they call it in the United States. So this is the fine line, and this is the thick line. I'll show mm. you. Let's see if you guys can see a little bit better yeah, right there. Yeah, I can see, yeah, so, reflection, yeah. So, so this will be a rose. So there's a little rose, if you guys can see that. Mm -hmm. And here's one that's already, I've already done all the baselines. And I started to do the shading already on this piece. And the shading I do with, 
two grades of fine sandpaper. Here's a little rougher sandpaper. It's a 280. That's the first pass. I do two passes. And I have to keep, you want to, I cut it at an angle to give it like a little point. Oh, okay. And then I do the shading where the shading needs to be, like just all freehand by eye. And the rougher sandpaper is like the first one. It takes a lot of paint off, the rougher sandpaper. And this is a smoother sandpaper. This is kind of like the flush it all out, kind of make it smooth, smoothen out the shading. So you're going back to the original color of the clay. Yeah, so it's kind of like reverse shading. Okay. It's a white piece that I paint black and I'm bringing out the white. So I'm taking away the black. Okay. So once I do the, I do two passes. So I'll do one pass with the rough sandpaper, which I started doing here. Then I'll do a second pass with the smooth sandpaper. Then I'll actually come back with the fine liner and do like the separation, do like double lines. And then the last line is the bold line. This is really what makes everything pop. You kind of see, it just brings that white out. That's how it starts to change. It starts getting form. And here, Here's the finished product. This is what it looks like when it's done. That's not fired, is it fired? Yeah, this one's fired. Okay. Wow. Oh. But, but this is what it looks like, the effect it achieves, the, the shading. And then... Okay. Can you here's tell a, us a little bit about the designs that you choose on your pots, where they come from? Here's another one. So I have two designs pretty, well, I have a lot of designs, but I would say I have two styles. These fish pieces are really like what I consider my minimalist style. It's got a lot of detail, but just in the fish. And like the backdrop, the water itself is like a lot of the design, as you can see, like where the fish are kind of floating. This is a they salmon. I ask how many hours it usually takes you to complete the surface decoration on a pot? This piece, this piece is pretty big, but it's one of my minimalist style, like the fish piece. So this one took about, say like two weeks and a half to oh finish my. the design. Okay. And that other piece, uh, the black piece, that one took about a month. It's oh, kind wow. of one of my just real dense packed in pieces. It's got a lot of work in it. Yeah. But like start to finish, like if you count, I tell people if you count the clay process, the painting, the polishing, and the make, the paint making was probably about like a month and a half total wow. for the fish to lift a piece, dry it, sand it for the big pieces. Yeah. Was, these smaller pieces, um, I can knock one out maybe in a week, maybe like three days if I just work my fingers the raw. <laughs> <laughs> but then when you get tired that's when the mistakes start to happen so that's what we try to you gotta because that's what it's kind of a, a curse in a way i tell people because my tortillas people want perfection i can't have i can't have any like the clay showing through and where it's not supposed to be or a ding or a crooked line i just you really can't because the buyers expect they hear my tortillas are like it needs to be needs to be up to par per se yeah it's a lot of it's a lot of pressure. The standards are high. Yeah. Standards are high. The but that's what I like to tell high. people also. There's real expensive pieces, but there's also 20, 30, 50 dollar pieces. There's the 
the lower end pieces, I should say, but they're smaller. They might be by a person that's not as famous, but there's really all prices in the village. Miguel. It's yeah. Jose. Jose, you, Miguel, either or. Okay. Um, could you tell me what the, uh, the slip is that you've used on the one you're showing here? This red one, all the red paint is just a red clay. So it's a red oxide. It's a natural red clay that we get from, we call this Pintura del Arroyo. Cause that's like just everything that's, it's paint that's by an arroyo, by a, a wash. That's how all our clays, cause we really don't have official names for clays. So the white clays will be like the Casala clays. That's what we call them because it's on the Casala land. That's where the clay is. So that's kind of just the names we put is like the location wherever it's by. Because there's no stores we can buy clay. There's no, uh, all our tools, like uh, as you guys can see, they're all just kind of stuff we have laying around. <laughs> so, so do you do all of your carving before it completely dries at some, some level of leather hard? No, no, this is completely dry. So it's about after a week after I take it out and scrape it out of the mold. When it's real dry, that's when uh, we sand it and then you scratch it. Some people do like, I've seen texturing. Some people do texturing on the pieces when it's wet, when it's leather hard. But most of the people work the pieces when they're, when they're, when they're dry. You set out a, a needle that you said you used somehow in the forming process. That, that's more so for like right here. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. See how that kind of, it's got a lip. So if you needed to cut anything like that, you use the needle. Like and, also, needle. and also when the piece, the piece is lifted to make the, the rim, like right here, this piece is dry already. But for example, if it, when it's wet, that's where you cut it with this needle. When it's wet, you cut it across to get that nice level lip or rim. So, so it's an actual needle instead of a needle tool that we would be using. <laughs> yeah, it's an actual needle. It's a syringe. <laughs> yeah. So when we, talked a... on, when we talked on Wednesday, Jose, you talked a little bit about the, the sort of the traditional designs and sort of the confluence of, of culture between um, the traditional um, ancestors in the area of Mexico where you're from, as well as the Pueblo Indians. Can you talk with us a little bit about that? Well, Paquime was abandoned about 90 years before the Spanish arrived. And that's the archeological site we have here, Paquime, which is really not, that's the name that the Apaches when the Spanish arrived gave the site. So we really don't know who lived there, but the Hopis have an oral legend that says the red city to the South was destroyed by the feathered serpent because they were sinners. And they said that they burned it. And to the archaeological records, the site was burned. And it was, it had a shade, uh, like they had, it was plastered in red clay. So it was the red city. So a lot of people contribute Pakime to being, and even the Hopi say that, uh, because they also use the same architecture as uh, Chaco Canyon. They have the T-shaped door architecture. And I use that on my other pieces as well. Like, uh, <laughs> That's the T-door. Mm. I use that in a lot of my pieces as well as the feathered serpent. And uh, Bakime, just to the archeological record, Bakime was the mixing of Mesoamerica with the Pueblos because of what they found there. They found the architecture as Pueblo, but also has the Mesoamerican architecture. And also they had turquoise, and they actually had, it was the only ancient site where they bred macaws. They have the full reproductive lineage of macaws here in Pakime. So that's why the Hopi also attribute us, Pakime, I should say, is to being their distant cousins. But like the Spanish, this place has a lot of history because the Spanish on their march to New Mexico in 1570 passed through here. So like my family is Hernandez on three sides of the family, but we're not related just because Hernandez literally means sons of Hernan. So like our culture was kind of lost. It just got cut up in the new world per se. And a lot of us have 
Apache and this and that, but it's in Mexico, sadly, it's kind of looked down on to be Indio. It's not a good thing. And I think that goes just back to the history of the Spanish caste system where you are less of a person according to your skin color and your rank in society. So people here are just like, oh, it's not, like my family, I, I, cause I'm real, I like to ask questions. So I'll ask my grandpa, who was your grandpa on your mom's side? No, it was a, he was a, he was a Spaniard. He had blue eyes and green eyes. And so my family has green eyes. And I ask him, well, who was the other side? Ah, he was, he was an Indio. He fought in the revolution. Who knows who he was? So it's not, sadly, it's, we've lost a lot of it. But this is kind of a, the big difference I would say between the natives in the United States and the natives out here. The native culture in the United States, it's really big. It's like cherished to be a dancer or beadwork or whatever art craft you may be. And here it's kind of just more to make money. You know what I mean? It's not really like that ingrained in us to be prideful of that. That's why a lot of people have honestly have gone to the States to go work at any job because it's a steady job. And I don't know, it's kind of like I was saying, I was telling earlier, it's not cool to be a potter here in town. <laughs> For us it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I take great pride in it and I always have. And I want to instill that in the younger kids. And that's why we, we've made a YouTube channel, like a mini doc about uh, one of my buddies in New Mexico. He has a small event space in Albuquerque. And it's just because kids are all into that YouTube and stuff like that. Right? So I'm trying to, like I said, try to make it cool to be a potter. Because most kids think pottery and they're like, oh, it's, it's museums or it's, it's kind of boring. It's like, what? No, it's, it's something that's going to last generations. Why don't you tell us uh, how long, what you do with this afterwards? Because um, we don't fire the same way that you do and we don't fire the same length of time that you do. <laughs> yeah, we have real low fire clay. Someone told me from a, a ceramic professor, I wanna say from Bavisby College, he came down and tested some clays. He said we were like almost at cone four or five. I don't know what that means, but that's in the firing room. <laughs> he said it's almost, because we do a time. It's usually about an hour in the fire. And uh, the way they used to fire, like you can fire this outside, but honestly, these pieces that I take a month on, I use an electric kiln. Because like we were saying, I can't have a piece of ember touch this and leave a burn mark because then it'll be like it's not perfection so i use electric kilns for these big pieces but if someone likes to do or come down and do a firing we've done firings outside the old school way and you do a wire mesh put like a wire mesh around this white clay the white clay is a lot different than the other clays because you do a wire mesh and it's kind of like the embers on top of that wire mesh but sometimes in smaller pieces will drop down and get on this and make like a burn mark and then in the pueblos part they still burn like that and they it's considered like a good thing but in matortis no people don't really want to see any defection any defects on the paint so there is like about three or four people in town no there's three people that fire that's all they do they don't even make pottery they just fire pieces for people and they charge us about 12 bucks per firing and there's people, honestly, that'll collect clay that don't know even how to wash it, but they'll just go collect it. There's people that'll sand pieces if you need them to. Like, it's a whole unorganized collective, pretty much. So there's about two people that make paint in town. There's a lot of people that don't know how to make paint. There's one family that's real big, the Lopez, Miguel Lopez. He's really big in to refining the clay because he's got a really good clay recipe. This clay, his clay recipe is real strong in that they hardly ever break in the fire. It's very, he almost guarantees his clay. So a lot of people buy his clay. He'll sell a bucket of five gallon clay for about, what is it, about 50 bucks. And there's people like I have, one of my cousins, he makes really good forms. So he does some of my forms. And then one of my, my wife's cousin makes some of our forms. And there's a lady in a store, a single mother, she works attending a store. And when she's not busy with that, she'll work lifting pieces right there in the store. She has her molds and stuff right there as well. But she looks more like figures. If I ever want a figure, I'll go with her. But I'm really trying, I wanna, cause I feel in town, there's the, 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 the title master potter is slung around quite a bit out here. 
because there's people that really do know a lot about pottery. But for me, a master potter is like, I make the paint, I make the clay, I make the form, I do everything. So I'm not a master potter. I tell people that right away, because I feel that term is very, it's a title to be earned, not really just throw it around like that. But yeah, there is there is a couple master potters in town. There's a couple master potters, sadly, that just don't sell like that because they don't have that fine, fine detail of work. But they're master potters; they do everything themselves. So an hour's time, yeah, that's what blew me away. <laughs> we fire for hours. <laughs> yeah, you guys got that high temp clay, right? Yeah. But that stuff's a lot better for like actually drinking out of and stuff. It's a lot stronger, I would think. Yeah. Well, these these you don't use it for food and stuff like that. No, because the paint the paint is toxic. It's manganese. It's heavier than lead. So this stuff's really not good for you. I had a guy come down from the college, the professor over there, and we were making the clay. He he asked me what it was. He was holding a piece in his hand. And I told him and even dropped it. He's like, "Oh, <laughs> you guys should be using gloves and." It's face mask. And I'm like, well, this is what people do. <laughs> and uh, I do use, but a lot of people, when they sand the pieces, they don't even cover their faces. And I know there's a disease called potter's lung. You get that fine, fine dust in your lungs. It's no bueno. And I've really pushed that on people down here. I'm like, you got to put a scarf over your face, even wet it if you can, and take a shower right away afterwards. Because this fine dust is just, it's so fine. And anywhere there's water, it just sticks. So if you'd imagine if you're, and then some people sand inside their homes, they don't even care, they'll just do it. <laughs> so it's even worse, you're just getting all this dust in your whole family's lungs. And it's just, and I tell people, but it's kind of a, I don't know if it's the machoism culture, they'll be like, ah, oh, you gotta, sometimes you gotta sacrifice for your family. That's what they tell me. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, oh, I understand sacrifice, but you gotta take care of yourself a little bit. And uh, there's a lot of, my wife used to do it when she paints with her brush, before dipping the paint, they'll lick the brush, literally put it in their mouth and lick the brush to get the paint on there. And I told my wife, I'm like, no, you can't do that because that stuff's literally heavier than lead. It's not good for you. And, and there's a lot of older potters, they get sick. They, I don't know what, if it's maybe the paint or, you know what I mean? I'm sure it's not helping, <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to get that also as like of awareness to the potters in town because I tell them, it's a big deal. I mean, cover your face if you if you're sanding and don't lick the brush. That's the worst thing you can do with. Because when I make paint, I put my hands in the water and even just like a minute of that, moving that stuff around, I pull my hand out and it looks like I've been in a pool for 30 minutes. It gets like wrinkly like that. I don't know if it's because it just absorbs into your skin so fast and it's that real heavy mineral. It's not. So I use gloves now too, because when the, I didn't know it was that like I was telling you, the professor had the manganese in his hand and it's just a rock it wasn't even grounded down or nothing yet and he dropped it he's like no you guys shouldn't be just grabbing that stuff like that so i'm uh, it's stuff that we're learning as well because i'm sure a lot of the potters don't even know that it's really that bad for you so i tell them it's not good you shouldn't be putting it in your mouth or grabbing it like soaking it into your skin so yeah. on the firing are you firing one piece at a time and, and about what temperature is that being fired to um like i said it's like cone four or five and these big pieces in the in in the lady that fires my pieces she can fit like just two of these because they're kind of big i don't know what size kiln it is but she can put more but i don't like them touching each other i've seen people that just cram the kiln and they're stacked on top of each other but i found like sometimes they'll they'll scratch each other like if it's touching and when you try to pull it out it might scrape the piece next to it. So I try to just these bigger pieces, just two, and these medium pieces, like five or six per firing. I try not to, to cram them in there too much. 1600 degrees is, we, we got that information from somebody down there. Oh, okay. Yeah, Diego, Diego's more, he's got the laser thermometer and all that good stuff. Diego Valles, he's one of mm -hmm. the more top potters. He's a master potter. He makes his own stuff. He's actually experimented even with that Japanese technique where they'll take the broken pieces and fill it in with like liquid gold or silver. I'm not exactly the name of that technique, but he's been using that quite a bit. And he also has a studio down there that he has, that people can go down and work in. He's the only person that has 
an actual studio. Yeah, yeah, he's got a nice little compound up in Santa Rosa, up a little about like 10 minutes away from us yeah. towards the mountains. Does anybody have any questions for Jose? Say, so, uh, you said that the the uh, coarse grit sandpaper was 280. Is the fine 400? Uh, the finest one I use is 350 when I'm sanding it down. Okay, thank you. Like right here, that's the 400 is what I use a sponge. This is a 400 sponge. That's the last one I put on there. And it's metallic sandpaper, the black sandpaper for metal or wet sandpaper, they say. So the red piece that you have there, is that the clay itself that you just burnished? Yeah, that's the clay itself. So we mix that red clay with that clear clay to make it stick. And then there's also, some people have brought in uh, low fire glazes. This is Duncan. It's a green Duncan. My wife uses some of that for like uh, some, Vegetation, she uses it for the leaves on some of her pieces. And that's mixed as well with that clear, the clear clay to make it stick. Hmm. And some people use just oil. They take and burnish, they, they put an oil bond, right? Yeah, furniture oil sometimes, my wife will do that. Or baby oil or... We have a... Horse oil. Macario told me he, yeah, Macario told me he used horse oil. Horse oil. I have no idea what that is. It's a type of oil for like if a horse gets injured. Oh, okay. Injury, and then there's also a, a we call it uno dos tres, but it's basically like a red pledge for for furniture. Mm -hmm. They'll put that on the clay itself if you want it, because you can burnish just the clay itself, mm -hmm. and it'll get real shiny or the black paint as well. And some people do uh, with graphite, like commercial graphite. Mm -hmm. They'll polish it with that. And that's a whole process in itself. You have to mix the graphite with diesel. So you put that on after the black slip. And then even the polishing stone of that, it's really kind of like sharp. It's not like a smooth stone like this. And that graphite will be like a really metallic color, like real black, but super metallic and super shiny. But those pieces, honestly, are kind of like um, fragile. You can't even grab them with like a ring or anything because that graphite is really easy to come up. And even when they're painting them, they have to be super careful. Even like a fingerprint will get up on the piece and it'll, it'll show up real, real noticeable. And, and the ones that, like the ones where they paint, you have to burnish it in order to paint because otherwise the brush doesn't cross the pot very well. It's really tricky. I tried honestly to paint it's with hard. the brush. It's it. very hard. It's hard. It looks easy, but it's super hard. That's no, why I had to well. I had to do my own little style like this, like because I know how to draw real good and uh, do tattoos and stuff too. So I incorporated that into the piece because I couldn't paint with the brush. <laughs> yeah, that takes a long time. Yeah, people think it's easy because they make it look easy, but it's super, super hard. No, it is not. Here's a drawing I finished not too long ago either. Mm. This is just pencil. Oh, that's nice. Oh, the details. And that's where I mixed. I feel like I went to the States and learned how to draw, then I came back here to mix it with the clay. <laughs> So you work out your designs out on paper first before you put them on a pot? Yeah. And a lot of these, a lot of the designs like flowers and the fish, I got pretty much just in my head and I go with the pin with the pin and then I change as I go. But a new design, basically all my designs start first on paper. So this is kind of like, a, these are some old stencils. So I'll draw it up first, it's a rose. Mm -hmm. Then you see the tape, I'll just put it right on the piece itself. And then scratch through it, okay. Then go over with the pin mm -hmm. on top of the paper. And that'll leave just a tiny little mark on the shiny clay. And then I'll use that kind of like as a guideline, but I'll change it up as need be. 
with the final hard line that's because once it's in the clay there's no going back so <laughs> so but that's honestly like for i do this for like real pieces that i haven't done before first i'll draw it up on paper then i'll do that but like for a lot of the flowers and stuff and the bumblebees i've done them so much now i can just go with the pin and just go over that hopefully once i get to the point it would save a lot of time if i could just do it all with the pin and just go over that and hopefully one day i could just freehand it all and not even use the pin but i'm so like nervous because i feel like because i've done tattoos and i always treated tattoos the same once it's on there there's no going back it's like for life per se <laughs> so i'm just like i'm super nervous about making wrong lines and stuff so i like to go with the pin first and then with my final line so after the pot's completed and it's been fired, do you put anything else on the uh, surface over the top, any kind of finish over the no, top? No, some, some people have, they'll put a, there's even like a certain type of polish. It's a spray polish, acrylic polish. Some people will put on it. And that's really, uh, really, it gives it a real, real good shine. But to me, it kind of changes the color of the clay. It'll make the clay like a little bit yellow or something. I mean, it doesn't give it that really yellow, that white pop. And too but shiny. yeah, I don't. Yeah. But some of the potters do. They'll put like a, I've seen even like a floor polish some people have put on the pieces to give it like a sealer, they say. They like to seal them. And it gives it a real, real shiny. But these are all, that, that shines all the, just the stone. And the black's a lot more shinier than the red. This red doesn't get that, that shiny as the black. It gets shiny. But I don't know why. Maybe it's because the, the clay itself is a little bit drier. Because even when I polish this, it seems like I got to use a lot more soap on the red. And on the black, it, I feel like it just glides. After it's fired, do you burnish it anymore to no. burn it at all? No. Once it's fired, it's pretty much done. You really can't do much to it. I could, you can scrape more. Once it's fired, you can scrape more if you need to but the polish won't go on and the paint won't stick either. Once it's fired, the paint won't stick. So it's kind of really like, we always like to do one final go over everything before that goes in the fire, make sure everything's good, polish it, maybe clean up some lines we need to. But uh, yeah, once it's fired, it's done. You really can't do much with it. And it's super nerve wracking. I always get, especially these big pieces, cause I'm just like, oh, is it gonna survive the fire? That's the, that's the number one question a month's worth worth of work down the drain if it doesn't. <laughs> so how thin are your pieces? Um, this one's pretty thin, less than an inch. Okay. This one's pretty thin. I don't know if you guys can see like that. Quarter of an inch. Quarter of an inch about. That's really about, that's really about what's standard. Everyone tries to get them that thin. Some people do it thinner as well. But is that's what goes back to the standard of the Matortiz. It can't be too thick because then it'll be too heavy because people like to grab them and they'll actually weigh them kind of like, wow, this is, this is real light. And the white clay loses a lot of weight when it fires and it shrinks a lot more than the other clays. I don't know why, but this white clay, once it's fired, it shrinks a little bit and it's, it's light. It loses a lot of weight. The red clays and the black clays, they really don't shrink that much and they don't lose that weight. So... So you got to have a thin wall so for it'll be a thin piece, a light piece. Are you able to support yourself doing this or is this in addition to another job? No, this is completely everything. My wife's been making pottery since she was 12. She bought her first car when she was 14, just with pottery. Because honestly, like what we make down here a day is about $9 a day. And we pay about $4 a gallon of gas. So you can do the math on that. <laughs> it's not really that much uh, in, the, in any job per se. Like you really can't. A lot of people that do, some people have a steady job besides this. But the people that are all in just like us, you have to. That's what makes us kind of, I would say, necessity is the best teacher. <laughs> you really have to grind and be on it because and there's a competition in the village as well kind of into like there's not that many buyers of high-end pieces like the bigger pieces there really ain't and this is what really helped me stick out is because my stuff is so different I'm literally the only one in town 
that does this style. And the other people have to compete with all the other people that have that style. You know what I'm saying? So this really helped me. It was a big blessing. It's gone down because of COVID, I would say, but I think COVID affected the world everywhere, I think. So it, when COVID hit, we were really hit down here because who wants pieces of pottery when you're, you can't move, you can't do anything. And it seems like it's starting to pick back up a little bit. So yeah, this is everything. We built this house with the pottery. I mean, everything, uh, we bought this house. They didn't have nothing inside. It was a dirt floor, just adobes. And slowly, about five or six years that I've been here, we've been slowly getting it together. Can you share a, um, a piece of your wife's pottery with us? Yeah, sure. She actually finished this one today. This isn't fired yet. But she makes uh, butterflies. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah, that's nice. So that she a, does that style. She scratches the background. So it's mm -hmm. all. Mm. And she also does hummingbirds and all types of different animals. But her favorite is her butterflies. <laughs> Let me show you this urn, actually. It was really nice. She made an urn for a gentleman in El Paso. I forgot we had that still. Put it more in the middle. Let me grab it. Let me grab the base and everything. There you go. Whoa. Oh, that's gorgeous. Uh, beautiful. This is an urn for a gentleman in El Paso. He bought it for a. Uh... That's why it's so big up here, because he told me it needed to have at least for two pounds of sugar, he said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, that's beautiful. Nicely done. Wow. All right, other questions from the group? So you do commission work at, uh, for people as well? Yeah, I do commission pieces or pieces I have fired. Um, certain designs like this one was, this is actually the flower prints, Chotuteli, the Prince of Flowers. And uh, a guy actually commissioned this piece and then he flaked out. He gave me the deposit, but I just gave him a piece that was the equivalent for his deposit because he told me he fell in hard times. It's understandable. I, it's just what it is, right? Got to roll with the punches if you're a potter. Really, <laughs> you don't have another option. <laughs> As we all know, right? Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll add um, Jose's email address to um the program notes um and so it'll be the, it'll be on the youtube video for anybody that watches this in the future but we'll also put it um uh we have a new program section on the website which i'll show you later and we'll put his information there uh and you know if anybody's interested in in ordering a pot from jose um we'll try to rebecca's agreed she's worked with him before or worked with the people in the village, we'll, we'll put something together to make the connections with potters here. And Jose, if you're interested. Yeah, for sure. That would be a blessing. Faj, yeah. I have a question. Go for it. Um, he mentioned a black clay. Um, where would that be from and what is it like? It's really kind of like a dark gray clay, but we call that Barro de la Mesa which is just like further up by the mountains on the west end of the valley. And we call it the Mesa just because that's where the, the Mesa is. That's what I was saying, like the, the clay is just named after whatever it's near. But that stuff is really, that's the strongest clay we have, I think, because I've seen 
Chevo Ortiz's son. Mm-hmm. He'll fire his pieces outside in a tin and throw them directly in the in the water while they're hot. And they don't explode. That's how he washes all his pieces. And he said, just like Chevo, this was the, the test of the strength of the clay. He said, that's how I temper my clay, he would say. And it's amazing because this stuff's literally hot, goes in the water sizzling, and comes out just fine. So th- it's heavier clay. It's more, I say, intact. It's got more like gravel and stuff in it. But that's real strong clay. And they make a lot of the black on black because they do a reduction firing. Because white clay is uh, with the embers, like I'm saying, in a mesh, and it's hot. A reduction firing, you put manure inside of a tin, then you cover it with the tin, and you put manure and bark on the top of it. And it don't matter if the clay's red or the paint's red, everything turns black because let the piece and the clay itself absorbs all the smoke from the manure. And it comes a real shiny black and it, it's real pretty. I like the black on black work, but that's a, that's a different type of firing. That's what we're Thank you, it's I'm really beautiful. Right? Do you have a website that has a gallery or a series of photos of what you've done over the years? I just barely recently got up on all this social media stuff and I started uh, Instagram and TikTok. I'm trying to do it all. So yeah, my, my Instagram is Jose Almarez and uh, my Facebook is Jose Almaraz. It, everything's Jose Almaraz. And uh, we have a YouTube series up on uh, YouTube. It's called Trails to Oasis. And you can see some of the village and some of the different processes there as well. But if you, anyone wants a piece commissioned or even from us or anyone in the village, honestly, because I, I try to help anyone that you like a piece or an artist, I can go try to get it for you. And uh, through my email, which will be in the website. This is a reduction firing here. This is by Armando Savetta. Beautiful. I love yeah. the black on black. Yeah. That was my, my, my auntie. I told Rebecca this is what really got me into it. When my first show and tell in preschool, I took a reduction fire turtle effigy that my aunt made because my mom would always buy pottery from my family members and give them as gift and have them in the house. So I always, always attracted to the black on black. I love it. Super pretty. Yeah. Anybody else have a question for Jose? Excellent job, Jose. Thank you so much. Oh, one thank you guys. Absolutely oh, gorgeous. One last question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go no. ahead. I just Jose, I was just wondering, um, I was curious, how did your village uh get the name Mata Ortiz? <laughs> Juan Mata Ortiz was actually an Apache fighter. He was oh. a sergeant under Terrazas. Terrazas pretty much was like the owner of the of Chihuahua State. He was the governor of Chihuahua. And it was a general under him and actually fought against Geronimo. Geronimo fought a big battle here in San Diego because this was the biggest band of Apaches was down here in this area. When they fought with, uh, in the States, they would come down here. So Juan Matortiz, the Apaches actually killed him because he, he, he pretty much was a traitor to him because here we always had good relations with the Apaches. So they would come here to trade all their stolen goods from the other towns, they'd come here and trade them. So what Juan Matortiz did, he got him drunk for about three days. He was taking alcohol to the encampment, <laughs> waiting for the Rasas and Sonora to get their troops to attack him, to wipe him out. But Juan Matortiz's regiment fired the shots before it was time and they were able to escape. But they told him when that happened, because they seen him, they knew who he was. They told him, we're going to burn you. We're going to burn you alive as a traitor. And that's what they did. They burned him alive as a traitor. And I don't know why they named us Juan Matortiz. But before Juan Matortiz, it was called Pearson. And Pearson was actually the biggest sawmill in the, the whole West Coast at his time. Here was a humongous sawmill. And uh, he died, I think, in the attack by a Russian submarine or something in the First World War. He was on a boat that got sunk. But he was, this was originally called Pearson. But before that, like there was people living here because there's ancient tombs. You can dig up ancient Oyas and stuff. You'll find them shards and stuff. 
So who knows what it was named before that? But first it was Pearson, then it was Juan Matortiz, which was an Apache fighter. Well, thank you. I was just curious because my maiden name um, was Mata. Oh, okay. So, so when I heard Mata Ortiz, I was just curious. Yeah, you could look him up. Look up Juan Matortiz. He'll break it. He'll break it down a lot thank better than so I did. I was like a, a general. <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem. Your work is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate this. People showing interest. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs>